The Reformation, the event that changed the world. We hope you enjoyed episode two, profiling French reformer John Calvin. In today's episode, we will profile one of the most colorful figures in church history. A man known for his passionate preaching of the Word of God. A man renowned for his fearless faith in the face of danger. We are speaking about Scottish reformer John Knox. Here to speak on reformer John Knox is one of our pastors at Haddonfield Bible Church, Pastor Greg Guzman. Welcome, Pastor Greg. Thank you for having me, Sam. So, this guy, John Knox, very fiery preacher. Definitely. So, what can you tell the viewers about who John Knox was? Well, his life is uh, kind of short, but uh, impactful. He was born in 1514 in Scotland, and uh, as in his adult life, he went to study at St. Andrews University. By 1540, he was uh, an ordained priest in the, uh, Roman Cat- by the Cat- Roman Catholic Church, excuse me. Uh, but as he continued in that study, as he devoted himself to reading the scriptures, and in particular the, uh, um, the, the writings of Augustine, he found discrepancies. He found that what he was asked to teach by the Roman Catholics, the teachings and the practices did not align with scripture. Uh, so he began to align himself with the thinking of the reformers uh, because the rumblings of the Reformation were happening all through Europe at this moment. Uh, so he, he, was, he was battling with this. And um, actually, by the fifth year 1540, he made a, a public statement that he was no longer a Catholic, uh, uh, but a Protestant. Obviously, he was removed from the priesthood, and uh, now he's out of a job. And one of the earliest works he had in his life was actually to tutor and teach children for Protestant families. So he was early involved, like in, in children's ministry and VBS and that type of stuff. Imp- the importance of bringing the Word of God to children. He began that ver- earlier, early uh, in his life, in his early ministries. Later on, he fled to Geneva, and he met John Calvin there. Uh, we know the impact uh, this man had, and he studied under him, learned under him. But sadly, uh, he, he, as his life uh, got older, at the age of 57, uh, he went to be with the Lord. Uh, he was, was succumbed to some health issues. He had a mild stroke. And uh, um, he, his life was cut short in the year 1572, but not without leaving a, a, an impact in Scotland and, and through Europe as well. Oh, amen. So, um, so what, what particularly in regards to the state of the church where he was in Scotland that he found troubling in regards to the teachings of the Catholic Church? Well, similar to most uh, European countries at the time, uh, the, the Scotland was loyal to the traditions of the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, so anyone um, at that time who would who would uh, 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 allow or help or or push like the propaganda as they would call it of the Protestant movement or the reformers was persecuted. Uh, they were arrested. They were beaten, tortured, and even murdered. Um, in fact, we all know um, Mary, Mary of Tudor uh, in England, right? The Queen of England, who was named Bloody uh, Bloody, Bloody Mary, was her nickname for her vicious, relentless yes. attack. On, on the Protestants and on, on the Reformers, I'm sorry. Well, John, uh, interesting enough, uh, uh, um, Knox had his own Mary that he had to deal with in Scotland. Uh, this was Mary, uh, Queen of Scots. And the only reason she, she was in power was because the, her husband, James, uh, died, and she had uh, an upbringing. Uh, she was, grew up in the Catholic Church, so when she came to power, uh, she, was, she rest assured that those traditions were preserved and the, the heavy hand of persecution was felt once she came into power. Uh, but it was interesting enough that it was during that persecution, actually, it helped him. It helped seal and affirm that he was in the truth. Because he felt as though it's not just the queen, it's not just priests. There has to be something above, far greater, that is so angered, so troubled at just the teaching of Scripture as it's clear. Uh, so... He had a good friend, uh, George uh, Wishart, who was evangelizing all to Scotland. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was learning through him going. He became like his bodyguard. So the queen ordered uh, George to be arrested and burned at the stake. And it was at that moment at the stake when George was about to be burned alive, when uh, John came, stood with a sword in his hand, and he was ready to die with him. But uh, George looked at John uh, as a young man and says, you're still young. You got much to offer. Uh, 
continue to do the work, uh, the preaching that you see me preach, and the whole and the convictions that you have through the Holy Spirit and uh, uh, according to Scripture. And, and John obeyed. He fled at that moment. He dropped his sword, but he picked up a double-edged sword, Sam. Now to wage war against Satan and the falseness of the doctrines of uh, the Roman Catholic Church. Amen. So this was the environment he was in right now. Amen. So, so if you can narrow it down, what would you say is the greatest impact on the church that uh, John Knox had? Well, he, he, uh, he rejected the papacy. He, uh, he pushed for the church to be governed by its uh, own officers, meaning that the church needs to be led by pastors and deacons and elders. Uh, according to scripture. Uh, he also, uh, with, along with five other Johns, known as the five uh, Johns of the Scottish Reformation, sat down and wrote the Scots Confession. It's like, uh, you know, like the creed, like doctrinal statements that we have here mm -hmm. at HBC, right? They help govern and keep us on the right track, that we don't deviate. Uh, so this, this confession helped uh, initiate the Church of Scotland uh, by these shoes, they held firm to. Uh, he wrote many other books also as well uh, for the church that helped with the church practice. Uh, you, you will like this church uh, worship, uh, discipline. Um, these things were actually, he was yeah, even criticized for that. He was so determined to be so biblical, uh, to be accurate to scripture. He didn't believe in m hymns mm -hmm. and even the organs in the church. So he removed all that and let's just sing the Psalms. Mm -hmm. But that just tells you how he held the high reverence for the view for, uh, of Scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, so he was. So these are some of the impacts he had uh, in Scotland. He was basically led the Protestant movement uh, through a Scotland in England as well, actually. So uh, this was some of the impact of the church. Yeah, okay, that's great. I think it's a great lead into the next question: is um, what the thing is his legacy? How should we think about John Knox? Um, like you said, as you began the introduction, he was a fiery preacher. He was a courageous man. His legacy is one who was not afraid to stand uh, for truth and speak his beliefs according to Scripture, even if it meant standing against kings and queens uh, in his time. He was a preacher who uh, uh, preached rough and uh, um, clear without mincing words. He, he was to the point. Um, some say that when this man preached, it was like he, there was thundering coming from the pulpit. Um, so, you know, his legacy is, again, that his allegiance, he, he gave answers not to man, but only to God. Uh, he is considered one of the most prominent uh, reformers of, of Scotland. And, and today we remember him as a man, as a man who knew that, uh, how vital it was for the church to obey and to adhere to the teachings of scriptures. Uh, and not what man tells you uh, to believe. Uh, in fact, at his very funeral... Uh, one of the noblemen in Scotland pointed to his casket, uh, to his coffin, and said, there lies a man who, did not, who never feared the face of another man. So you can tell that his life was devoted to God mm -hmm. and Scripture. That's his Amen. legacy. And um, I think also as well what you pointed out in regards to his impact on education, and there's history on that, that he mm -hmm. impacted what we know as formal education mm -hmm. with some of his works in Scotland, similar to Calvin, what he did with uh, impacting culture in his uh, era in Geneva. Yeah. So um, definitely, uh, you know, the reformer John Knox. Also, one thing I want, I, I've read about him, and maybe you can elaborate a little more, but that the dual nature of John Knox in, re in regards to when he would step onto the pulpit, there was fire, mm -hmm. but those around him knew him as a humble man mm -hmm. when he was home. Mm -hmm. He was, he didn't want the attention, and similar to Calvin, um, Neither one wanted to be out there preaching, mm -hmm. and they kind of were both almost threatened mm -hmm. to get into the position of mm -hmm. preaching. So if you can touch on that a little bit. Well, remember I told you one of the earliest works he did was teaching and tutoring children. Uh, it's interesting, when, uh, when he was persecuted, he hid uh, at, at, at the castle of St. Andrews as well, and there there were families, and he gravitated towards the children and mm -hmm. taught Bible studies. He was also in prison, if, if we haven't mentioned that before, uh, in, a, in a French uh, galley. For a year and a half, I believe, uh, is, is the time, if I'm not mm -hmm. accurate. Um, but while there, he was preaching to people, bringing the gospel to bear. Um, so one would say, you know, people are afraid of him, you know, fire from the pulpit. But yet he was personal mm -hmm. and he approached and, and children could go to him and pe people would go to him. So definitely there's a humbleness 
uh, that was uh, displayed by him. And it has to do with just the humbleness that come from yeah, the yeah. word of God. It humbles yeah. all of us. And he humbled him, and he had a love for people. Mm-hmm. Uh, like many of the reformers, their goal was to remove the veil, uh, right? That the nobleman, that the plowman, mm-hmm. anyone can have access to God and, and not uh, the burdens that the Catholic Church were placing on people. So they had a love for people. Amen. But he was courageous nonetheless. Amen. And I, I'm just, uh, that whole big impact in such a little mm-hmm. time just goes to show that where God wants to do a work Amen. doesn't matter. It can, he can mm-hmm. happen. He can create an explosion in so little time. Now, as a final question, Pastor Greg, is do you think um, church history matters? Definitely. Definitely. Uh, think about it this way, Sam. Um, uh, just in the same way, uh, a doctor who's treating a new patient is so vital for that doctor to know the family health history of that family to be able to treat this new patient he's working with, right? When things arise, what medications they might be allergic to in the past, it's all vital for the healthy growth of that new patient. Yeah, let's look at it in that angle. It's the same way with church history. It is vital for the growth and the health of the church. Through church history, we see the mistakes we once committed, the errors we came out of. But not only that, we learn to appreciate the sacrifice Mm -hmm. of godly men and women who stood up in tough times to allow us to have the Mm -hmm. freedoms that we have now today. So think about it this way, Sam. Um, We all have a moment in time. Like you said, uh, John, his window was short. uh, 57, he died uh, at the age of 57. Uh, If the church is to continue now, let's say 30, 20, uh, 30, 40, 50 years from now, what are those believers are going to look back and think of us. Mm-hmm. What impact are we going to do? That's why church history is important. And right now, you know, Sam, we're dealing in society with through the courts and politics. We're fighting the sanctity of marriage, the sanctity of life. Um, we as a church, do we quiet down or we just go with what the you know, government tells you we ought to believe in? Or do we take hold of scriptures, mm-hmm. affirm the truth of scriptures, and defend ourselves to the point that we may be persecuted as well? Uh, which side of history are we going to stand on, right, mm-hmm. when they look at us if God allows that from, from the future? So church history is vital. Uh, and, and you know what? What I see in that also is that church, through church history, we see the sovereign hand of God as the church of God continues to prevail. Um, every time, every time the church begins to either deviate from the plan of God, we see that God will rise up men and women who are fearless uh, for the truth of Scripture, for the doctors of, uh, you know, uh, um, of Scripture, and, 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 and not allow the church to deviate and continue to walk according to our calling, our purpose, and what he destined us to be. Yeah, and um, if you, church history also shows us that there's been exponential growth during times of persecution. And um, definitely the Reformers, John Knox, and many of the ones that we've spoken about in the past few days, uh, experience persecution, but going back to the basics of Scripture, that's what gives us the fearlessness. And so, as you said, as when we face the current uh, times that we have where being a Christian is not going to be popular, it's going to get less popular, mm-hmm. but we can look back at the church history and be, you know, rejuvenated with strength in regards to the fact that God will hold us. Amen. Pastor Greg, thank you for joining us today and speaking on this fiery reformer, John Knox. And thank you, the viewers, for joining us. As we have heard in this episode, persecution is not far away from those who stand for God. And it may not be far away from us even here in this country. But we'll leave you with the words of the fiery preacher, John Knox, who said, the man who stands with God is always in the majority. This has been a production of Haddonfield Bible Church. Until next time, grace and peace.